What up, what up? It's your boy Paul P. I serve God. I'm not God. This is just my opinion. And welcome to another episode of the Nothing to Something Podcast. Man, we have a special one for you guys today. So today, we got a man here who has been killing it consistently as a comedian. And Someone we would call one of the legends in our community. How I definitely would call him. You know what I'm saying? We respect this man work ethic. We think he is funny as hell. And if you come from the culture I come from, we have been seeing him do his thing since we were kids. He is a comedian, an actor, entrepreneur, and so much more. The one and only Michael Blackson, man. <laughs> What's up, motherfuckers? I'm in the building, man. Man, you are definitely in the building, man. How you doing today, man? How's everything going? I'm doing good, man. You know, you you mentioned you watched me since you was a kid, and you know, we I've been young. doing this since 29, 30 years almost. You know, man. And I was just talking to one of my. I, I was at the barber shop today. You know, and right before I got in the seat, Omarion was in the seat. The guy oh. cut Omarion's hair. Okay. And I looked. I'm like. Damn, this nigga been looking 16 for 30 years. <laughs> you know, and that's how, you know, I said, that's God chooses, when God chooses entertainers, yeah. he gives us his longevity. You know, Real we're talk. special people. Like, you know, people see me, they be like, Mike, what are you, 25 years old? I'm like, nigga, I've been doing comedy longer than 25 years. Man. You know, so uh, when, when you're chosen, man, you know, you know, you came from God and God keeps yeah. us, preserve us and keep us looking young and looking for to entertain you guys for a long time, man. Real talk. And you still got the young look. The lineup's still straight. Oh, I, the, it ain't back there ain't yet. Back you know what I'm saying? No, I'm gonna stuck Yeah, yeah. That's what's up. That's what's up. So here on the Nothing to Some podcast, Mike, we like to get your Nothing to Some story. So uh, let's start from the beginning of, of where your life is, was in, to where your life is now. So with that being said, uh, you come from Ghana, right? Kiff, you know, I represent all of West Africa, man. You know, I, I don't like to point a country you know I, I represent all of their their west part like you know i spent some time in, you know um, most of my life in, was in liberia i actually okay. got my education in nigeria you know ghana is my blood okay. you know so i i rep all those countries you know i i hate picking one of them because they all feel like i'm theirs mm. so i'm like you know what i rep i rep ghana big i rep liberia you know of course and nigeria was kind of like a place that disciplined me. You know, I spent three years in school there, and wow. I think I got most of my discipline in Nigeria. So wow. I just rep all those, you know, they called it ECOWAS. Uh, um, you grew up ECOWAS. It's just like East uh, econom Economics of West African Community, something is called. If my, I want to fuck it all up and <laughs> smack the shit out of me when I go back home. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so I rep, I rep all those places, you know. Um, Left Africa at the age of thirteen. You know, that's when I came to America. My mother, my mother is and was an evangelist. Uh. You know, it's always the preacher kids, man. They got the worst mouth, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All the preacher kids. You got ain't the, lying. And my mom was an evangelist. You know, from uh, my mother. You know, she left my daddy. I was very young. I was probably three years old. Yeah. And my mom had seven kids with my father. I was about three years old, and you know she gave her life to Christ, and you know Daddy did not want to live that life. That's what my mom said. That you know I don't know I wasn't there. Yeah. But my mom said, "Hey, you know your dad wanted to live a different path, so you know she didn't want to live go the route that he wanted to go. So she she took us her own route, and we started traveling. Yeah. Throughout Africa, you know, wow. going from villages to villages, preaching. You know, I was a little kid, you know, just following my mama. Man. You know? 
you you kind of got to upbring it like my family. My grandfather was a pastor as well. They had 19 kids. Damn. Yeah, yeah, him and my grandmother. Yeah, Boy, and your he, poor grandma, she okay? <laughs> she passed away a couple oh, of years man. back. Oh, man, rest in peace. You know, Goodness. man, but, uh, uh, but I mean, uh, uh, they used to travel doing revivals and stuff mm -hmm. like that, so they never was really set in one never school. Never set. Never, you know, so. So true, man, because, yeah. you know, I remember my whole education background. It was like I remember being in, like, from – Kindergarten to like eighth grade. I don't remember ever being in kindergarten. I remember being in first grade. I remember like maybe um, third and fourth, never did fifth, never did seventh. And then when I came to America, I'm like, okay, I'm 13 years old. I need an eighth grade transcript. And I Damn. and they sent it to me and I had to I had to go to the eighth grade. Yeah, yeah, Even yeah. Even though I missed half of my whole elementary school life. But you know, that was just all part of God's plan, man. You yeah, know? yeah. And, what Mm -hmm. Yeah, when when you was in Africa before you came out here, was yeah. you was you already in that, like that joking stage? Oh, no, was you man. you wasn't doing none of that I was at that a time? Boy, I was you know I was I was um from childhood to about thirteen and a half. Yeah, uh, no joking. But you know what? I do remember at one point in my life because you know when you you know with my comedy and my hardcore, you know my shit is like a Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy type material. Yeah, you know and. It just don't come out of nowhere. Regardless, you know, I knew I grew up with, like, gospel and church and preaching the gospel, but, like, this thing came from somewhere where, you know, um, and I, I, I kind of thought back. I was one time I sat back. I'm like, where, 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 why are my mouth so bad? Like, where did it come from? And then I remember being six years old. I remember taking a tape recorder and just recording myself saying a bunch of profanities at six years old. Wow. I remember that. And then it, it all came back. I'm like, that's where my bad mouth came from. Because even when I started comedy, I was very clean. I refused to curse for some reason. Uh -huh. My first couple of years, I was very clean. And then I started, you know, um, and I was raised in Philly, you know, so I started going to um, New York to perform. I'm going to go back to your question, but I just want to yeah, come. Yeah. I want to go back to where the, the profanities came from. So I started yeah. going to New York from Philly to do shows, and New York crowd is no joke. Yeah. You know, you cannot come up there and tell no long story. New York is about joke, joke, joke after joke. And like, arr, arr, you got to come hardcore. And I grew up in the Def Jam era. I mean, you know, where Def Comedy Jam was yeah. like this and that. And that's where that's where my comedy started, you know, from. Um, that's when my shit became some hardcore from just going to New York and performing in New York. Late crowd, midnight shows. And these guys ain't come out to hear no bullshit. Yeah, yeah. So you had to come correct. Yeah. You know, but comedy did not start in, com in, in Africa at all. When I was a kid... You know, I was just pretty much help my mom preach, giving out pamphlets, going door to door, you know, knocking people doors to preach the gospel to them. Yeah, yeah. And um, I would just, and then the little bit of chance that I was, we wasn't traveling or moving around, I tried to get an education. Yeah. You know, I tried to go to school, you know, and when I went to school, school was everything to me. I was, you know, in America, the, the, the jocks and the thugs and the, you know, get the girls. In Africa, it's the nerves. When you're smart, it's a good thing. Yeah. You know, so you look forward to being smart. You, you study your work and you, you know, and back then, you know, you go to school and you you, you fail, you get beaten in school. You'll yeah. whoop your ass in school. The teachers will beat you in front of everybody. Damn. Can you imagine trying to get some pussy after you got your ass kicked? But you, you ain't getting, no, you ain't going out, no, ain't no girl trying to date a, a nigga that just got his ass whooped. <laughs> In front of the whole class. Yeah, yeah. And they'll whoop you. Nigeria ain't no joke. Man. And, man, man them 80s, man, they'll take a little cane and, psh, 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 you know, you do. Yeah. They have a spelling bee. You spell something wrong. Psh, yeah, yeah. You got ass whooped in school. Yeah. yeah. That nah. was before child abuse. I think they probably calmed down on that right now. Yeah, yeah. I always said my grandfather's in that era. We used to have to take our shirts off and we got whipped with extension cords and shit on oh, the back. Psh, psh, you know what I'm saying? So I know a little bit about that. But, you, feel you know, me? all that, all that, that was, contributed to who we are today. Exactly. Because exactly. we can't beat these new kids. <laughs> no. These motherfuckers are all <laughs> fucked up, man. It ain't happening. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Did you have any siblings? Like, oh, yeah, my mom, like I said, my mom had... Well, you said you had seven. Yeah, yeah. Was y'all all close? Like, we like, were very close. Okay. At, when we were kids, you know, yeah. um, when we came to... We, we did eventually somehow did, got distance, you know, and how we got distance was when we... My mother brought me and my two younger sisters to America first. Yeah. Because people don't understand how hard it is for foreigners to get a visa to America. It's tough. It's, yeah. and, and then not only just a foreigner, it's like... African foreigners. It was very, yeah. very difficult to get a visa. You, America wants to make sure that you are going, you don't go the fuck back home. 
If you you like a, a young man like yourself, thirty years old, whatever, let's say you you you're in Ghana or Liberia or Nigeria, you go to the embassy, hey, I wanna come to America. They'd be like, Why are you going to America? Yeah. Oh, um, okay, nah, nigga, deny, it, bye. Yeah. You don't know what you're gonna come from with that. So now, okay, probably one of the easiest ways, like maybe if you got some kind of um maybe you have some kind of college, some kind of scholarship or to go to school, or you got stepped out of school, you know, that might be a a a good chance of getting a visa. Yeah. Be thirty years old. Obviously, your ass ain't going to college right now. You should be done. So, like, why are you like? Why are you coming here? Why I'm you visit? How, visit? How we know your ass is not going to stay and I want to go back? Yeah, yeah, you know. So that is very, very difficult to come. In fact, the the only reason why I was even able to like get a visa to come to America because it was my mom and my two younger sisters, and they knew we had other brothers back home that we we, we just can't leave them. Yeah. So they know we eventually we have to come back. Yeah. And then at that time, my mom that my mom had remarried, so her husband was still in Liberia. So I said, "Okay, well, uh, this nigga gonna come back." Yeah, <laughs> and that's the only reason we got a visa, you know. So yeah. it's very difficult. Or if you maybe you could say you come in the shop, and then then you have to prove that you have millions of dollars. They want to yeah. make sure you gonna come back to your money. Yeah, you know, yeah. America's not gonna let you in unless they know your ass is going to hell to go back. Yeah. Well, make sure you won't go back. So right. it's very, very difficult. So because of that, it wasn't easy to bring everybody to America. Mm. You know, so so it's probably we, like a slight, you know, you, maybe jealousy there and things like that because well, you was no, able to come. Oh no, no, not not because when I, you know, I came at thirteen, fourteen years old, and um, I mean, it took a while. Like we went, you know, when I eventually when I was able when I was able to work finally, you know, I fast forward. I'm like. 21 22 years old you know i just um i started comedy you know i was working at that time i had a job and i had comedy at the same time so i was able to send my brothers them home money every whatever okay. to help them out so oh there was no they, they, they loved me I was, I, I was a little brother that became a big brother because you know america like you gotta you come to america you shit change you america you have to grow, you'll grow up right away yeah, this country yeah. is no joke you know because oh, i was working from age 14. So I was working just to help my family back home at that age, you know. Wow. So I was sending money, and you know, and I didn't get a chance to see my some of my brother and sisters for 15 years. Yeah. So 15 years later, I'm finally I just did a movie next Friday, you know. I I finally I went back home for the first time after being in America, and that's when I was able to see my brothers because it was that difficult for them to come. At one point, I bought them all ticket plane tickets, and they went and got denied a visa to come. Wow. Damn. And the only way they were able to come, I think, eventually they all came, you know, except for my oldest. My oldest never, he's still back home. He never been to America. But the only reason, you know, now you have, like, a chance of winning a lottery. You can win a lottery to get a visa. Okay. You know, I think one of them won the lottery, and um, I'm not sure how the other ones were able to make it happen. But at that point, they were all pretty much grown, you know, with their own, um, some had kids and everything, you know. Yeah. But it slowly, like, came. When they got older, yeah. you know, I, um, yeah. But yeah, but those fifteen years that I didn't see them kind of like separated us apart with like two different people. Yeah, wow. Know? Yeah, you know, I, America was, and in, in, in my time in America was, you know, during this time was the early years was very rough. You know, yeah. it, mind you, it's me, and my mother, and my two sisters. You know, and then she had got married, so eventually she, uh, her husband had when she came on it, when she brought both of us. Three of us, um, a few months later, her husband passed away. Uh -huh. So she had to go back home to go bury him. When she left, she left us in America, me and my um, me and my sister next to me. Yeah, yeah. And took the baby. She took the baby with her and then yeah. just let me, my, uh, my sister. And then we struggled. We stayed in a shelter home where we had to, you know, go to school and wear hand-me-downs. And, you know... It, it was it was very very rough, you yeah. know. What I mean, so it wasn't easy. Yeah, and yeah. this was in Philly, right? You came. Nah, to Philly. Philly came later. That's actually my first three years was okay. Jersey. Okay. okay. That was Newark, New Jersey, yeah. and then my mom went and buried my um, step pop. And when she came back, when she came back, it was about a couple of years later, and then that's when she had some friends that lived in Philly and told her, "Hey, Philly is, is a little more affordable." Okay. And so that's when she took all of us. Me and my sister, we moved to Philly. Yeah, you know, and I remember we got our first row home. It's just a three bedroom, three hundred dollars a month. I remember wow. that summer of eighty nine. Wow, three hundred dollars a month. What was paying? I finally had my own room for the first time. You know, um, 
That's where it all, you know, that's where it all started. When I got to yeah. Philly, Philly did make a difference because in Jersey was a lot rough. By the time I got to Philly, I pretty much knew a little bit more about America, what it takes to fit in. Yeah. I mean, those first three years in Jersey was rough. The yeah. kids clown me every day. I mean, I was going to say, you did say that you used to get bullied a lot oh, when you bully, first came man. to America. Can you talk about that a little bit, just getting bullied all the time? Oh, yeah. I mean, the first time, I remember, um, you know, just being outside, playing with some kids, and it was like, hey, you black. I said, yeah, of course, we are black. They said, no, nigga, you black as shit. That's when I realized I was dark skin because oh, I had man. no idea. Because, you know, back then as a kid in Africa, we have guys, your complexion, my complexion, we never saw complexion. Uh, I didn't see that shit till I came to America. Yeah. You know, it's like, you, I'm like, I thought it was all black. They said, no, you black as hell. And then, then I got to go through all the dark skin jokes I went through, you know, look like under the bed. I look like I have you no look like up. what? Under the bed, nigga. That's dark <laughs> as fuck, nigga. <laughs> no, they literally said you look like under, under the bed. The bed. Damn, that's, I, that's yeah, fucked up. They told me I look like I have no bright ideas. Damn. They told me the difference between me and midnight is 11.59. <laughs> they said when are God, you making this shit for real they That's said when point. God said let there be light I was out of town <laughs> they told me I look like I smoked cigarette backwards they really told they you they told me I have to wear white gloves before I eat chocolate so I don't bite my fucking fingers they told me every time I take a shit I take my dick for <laughs> They told me Stevie Wonder sees me every day. <laughs> dark as fuck, my nigga. Oh man, some kids said this. They said every time I go outside, free nights and weekends kicks in. <laughs> they told me I could never tell a white lie. <laughs> oh man, it was rough, man. So you know, um, damn. That was my early age, and then. Cl- no, that besides the dark skin jokes, now go going to the fashion clothing, you okay. know, and, and this is why, like you know, I spend probably about a good five to ten percent of my income on my fashion because yeah. I went through a rough childhood of not having clothes. Mind you, I told you we lived in a shelter home, so we wore whatever was given to the shelter. Yeah. And I remember even before my mother left, left and and came back, I remember her taking me shopping for my first day of school. This is my first day in the eighth grade in America. Because uh-huh. back in Africa, you know, when I was a kid, girls like guys. When, when you get a new clothes, that's how you get the girls. Girls, oh, he has new clothes, you know, back home. And, but in America, you know, not only has to be new clothes, it has to be name brand, you know. And um, I remember my mom took me shopping. She had much money. She took me to the place called, like, Woolworth. That's some that's an old school store from back in the day. Your, your parents probably know about Woolworth. That's where you buy like pants like six ninety nine, yeah. shirts five ninety nine. She actually bought my sneakers in a um, grocery store, yeah. Pathmark. She bought chicken and then she bought my sneakers. Uh. I was wearing chicken flavor sneakers, my nigga, for like a whole year. <laughs> you ever wore? What dinner smell like, motherfucker? <laughs> nah, never, never. So yeah, so I, I rocked some Payless shoes before when I was a kid. You know, we was poor too, but okay. I, I know chicken flavor. Yeah, you know so I had saying? chicken flavor sneakers, my nigga. Okay. Yeah. My, my sneakers oh, are right man. next to some fucking wings. Damn. So yeah, so we um, we uh, what did we do? So yeah, so my first day of school, I'm just excited about having new clothes. I had no idea my clothes has to have name. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I get to school. This is in North Newark school called Broadway Junior High School. You know what I mean? And um, I walked in school. I'm proud of my new outfit. I have like a church pants, church shirt, and a chicken flavor sneakers. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. And then I get in there and the kids like, okay, you got new clothes. They're like, what you wearing? I said, oh, it's brand new. They said, yeah, but it's not Nike. It's not Adidas. It's not Puma. It's not Wrangler. It's not Lee's. I said, nigga, it's brand new. Nobody ever wore this before. Yeah. <laughs> I was excited about my new fucking outfit. <laughs> Them niggas lit my ass up, motherfucker. Damn. So now, you know, so that was that was a rough time of the, that was the beginning of my rough year with fashion. So I said, okay, now I gotta wear name brand. Not only I gotta be, have new clothes, I gotta have find me some Reebok. So I remember at like fourteen years old, fifteen during the summertime, I t- I had a uh, um summer job, you know, uh this one guy used to take a bunch of, you know, unfortunate kids to rich neighborhoods and make make us sell these candies. Yeah, yeah. These these candies that cost them like probably um fifty cents each. 
we sell them for like three fifty, three dollars fifty cents th- box of candy. You know, like caramel nut clusters, peanut brittle, uh, animal crackers, and then so this guy used to take us to these um neighborhood and make us sell these candies. But he was, I remember he was a Muslim guy, but he, you know we were we were representing some church. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like the name of the comp- the name of the group was called like the Mount C- Mount Calvary Youth Court. Okay, I'm like Mount Calvary Church, but I remember the guy being Muslim, so he yeah. just you know he took us to the to these neighborhoods, white neighborhoods in Jersey. Yeah, and we knock people doors and sell these candies, and out of every box we sold, we'll get like seventy five cents. Okay, you know, so then I start. That's when I started like making a little bit of money. Got you, got making you. Making little fifty seventy five dollars a week here, saving my money. That's what's up. I had to get half to my mom, and then the rest I saved. And then during the um, school year, I went and bought me some Reebok. Yeah, wow. I mean, at least you got to, you know, figure it out and everything I like that, you know. But I want to say, so talking about, you know, you're a comedian, you know, Mike, and just uh, uh, changing the subject a little bit, talking about bullying and everything like that, I want to know what were your thoughts you know, when you saw uh, Chris Rock get slapped by Will Smith, you know, uh, because it was a joke, you know, did you feel like that was bullying or what were your thoughts oh, when you saw that? Wait, that was bullying at the, at the highest level. You know, and we, I want to even go back to eighth grade. I remember I was, you know, I took education very serious. I know a lot, and when I went to school, I mean, my goal was to get all A's. And I remember at the end of the school year, I remember I had all A's on my report card and I think the word got around. I remember one time I was getting on a bus and some bully just sucker punched me because he found out I had all A's. Uh-huh. Sucker punched me while I was getting on the bus and then ran off. I remember that. So, you know, that was totally bully. You know, I mean, the thing about it is, like, I don't understand. I try to understand on Will Smith's point, like, where what made him do that. Yeah. You know, um, I've, I've never been a believer in any, anybody hitting somebody because, you know, I feel like, if Chris Rock was uh, 6'5", 250 pounds, muscles, when he had did that, <laughs> probably not, right? So that's nah, bullying. You yeah. bully somebody you know you could beat. Yeah. Period, you know what I mean? So he was definitely wrong. And but How do you think you would have reacted if that was you? If you was Chris um, Rock in that position? Uh, yeah, I, would, I probably would have did what Chris Rock did, but one thing I would, I would went to another level of like, you know, following report and taking it to the next level. I won't let him get away with it. I'll do it the American way. You know, American, yeah, I would, yes, you know, street, this and that, credibility, yeah. Nigga, when you 45, 50 years old, nigga, all that shit, you go by the law. Yeah, yeah. I would have called the cops on the nigga. <laughs> <laughs> you going to jail, motherfucker, okay? You mean light-skinned nigga in jail. <laughs> on top of that, you know you want to jail, then I'm going to sue you, okay? Yeah, I'll yeah. I'll make sure you're so broke. You have to move back with your auntie and uncle in Bel Air, motherfucker. You're going back to Uncle Phil's house. You and uh, Carlton going to be roommates again, my nigga. I would, I would have tried. Oh, That's how man. I would have went. And I'm, I'm hoping, you know, there would. Uh, um, I mean, I then I try to, like, understand. I try to have the brains of Will Smith. Try to see what, where this went to, how he got to this. You know, and I think I got close. To where, and I could be wrong, I'm not sure. I'm just trying to think, like, what would make him do that? Yeah. You know, so, and then we go back, let's go back a few years with the, um, uh, when I think they were boycotting the Oscars when Chris Rock was hosting, remember that? Uh-huh. You know, and then um, I think Chris said something like, um, I, I guess he was talking about, like Jada wasn't invited or something. Right, yeah, right, yeah. wasn't invited. And, you know, it's like Rihanna panties, I'm not, you're not invited or something like that. Like Rihanna's panties, right. yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I, so I said, okay, okay, maybe he, what he's trying to say, like, like Jada is not good enough to be invited to that, to that war. Like, she's not a great enough actress. You know what I mean? So, okay, you say you're saying my wife is not a great enough actress. Okay, so now we, uh, and I, that's, that's probably the only thing I could think of. Like, you know, this guy been going hard on my wife for a long time, whatever. Yeah, you know, but still, regardless, in the American law, you cannot put your hands on people. Yeah, period. real talk. I mean, and and that wasn't it because after that, we saw Dave Chappelle get attacked. You know, but they they beat the hell out of that dude. I mean, but I did you think that was real? You was there? I was there when it happened. It was weird though. It's so yeah. weird. I ha- you know, it's it's kind of like I was backstage, and then like next thing you know, it just I'm like, huh, what the hell? It happened so fast. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it just you know, back the, America's full of copycatters. Yeah, yeah. America's full of so much, you know, and a lot of time 
when people look up to people and people do things and try to copycat them, look at all these serial killers that copycat other serial killers, you know. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying whether it's real or not. I mean, that guy was probably just a copycat or looking for attention. And he guys, I mean, he guys ass beat. He yeah. ended up with two left arms. I saw that nigga arms <laughs> when he was done. He definitely had two left arms. He was walking yeah. backwards. My yeah. Man. yeah, he was. He went. He was not needed and bull like it in yeah. the arms at the same time. Yeah, yeah, man. So I don't, I don't. But yeah, bad. Will Smith was wrong, and, and he's trying, you know. And, and I know after the whole thing, he tried to find a way to make it work, work. But yeah, you smack, smack me in front of the whole world, man. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if I could forgive you for that. Yeah, real talk, man. I, I don't yeah, know. Know. Bad, you don't, you don't get it wrong. Chris, I got some fun. Yeah. <laughs> Got something coming, yeah, huh? Yeah, you got something Okay, coming. okay. Like, yeah, he's, he's gonna get back. Comedian, that's what we do, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I might not fight you in person, but I'll beat the shit out of you online, motherfucker. <laughs> I feel you, I feel you. <laughs> uh, now, going back to, uh, you know, you, you now in Philly, you know, young kid and everything like that, you know, uh, trying to make a way. In, in Philly, was it kind of, you know, crazy out there? Like, you, did you notice the gangs, violence, you know? Nah, you I know mean, what? According, according to, like, Meek Mill and Will Smith, Philly, Cassidy and all them, Philly is raw, you know what I'm saying? So, where was you at in Philly? But that was, you know, we now we talking about, like, early 90s in Philly. That's early 90s. It was really real gangsters out there, yeah. really killers, yeah. you know, and you just got to stay out of the way, you know. Um, I could have easily, you know, at, at this moment, we are in Philly, me, my mom, my two sisters, my mom, and this is what most foreign women do in other in, in America they all become like not real nurses aides they just go and like stay in old people homes and take care of them mm -hmm. so they'll mostly just be home they'll probably get the weekends off when their family comes and then so my mom was gone Monday through Friday Gosh. you know so she'll come on the weekends when we pretty much up so you pre was pretty much raising ourselves mm -hmm. I could have easily joined gardeners involved with it. It was an easy thing to do to start selling dope on the corners. That was, that was the, that's yeah. when dope dealers was on the corner back then. I could have easily done that, you know, but when I got to Philly, the first thing I was able to do was find a job. I was working at Domino's Pizza, actually. I started off answering phones and delivering pieces on a bike, and then one thing led to another. I became manager later on after I graduated high school. But, you know, me, I just pretty much went to school, got home, got on the bus, went to work, Got home late night, get up in the morning, go to school. I was staying away from the streets. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I was, you know, when I started making tips, delivering pieces on a bike, people thought I was like, um, you know, I was buying nice clothes. And the thing about when I got to Philly, nobody knew the history, what I went through in Jersey. I'm yeah. like, it's a new beginning for me. They don't know nothing about me. You know, they can't roast what you don't know, you know. And back then, back then it was all about, um, you know, what's, um, it wasn't that many Africans in, in not that many foreign Africans in America then. It was mostly Jamaicans. Yeah, yeah gotcha. You know, so then the black Americans were more familiar with Jamaicans. So anybody that was dark skin with an accent, they just assumed you was Jamaican. Uh. And what did Jamaicans do back in the day? They were all what? Drug well, dealers. Gangsters, yeah, gangsters basically. Yeah, dealers. yeah, yeah. So these niggas thought I was a drug dealer in Jamaican. <laughs> I, just, I just kept my mouth shut. I'm like, yeah. just believe whatever you want to believe. As long as you believe that, you're not going to fuck with me. Yeah, you know? yeah. Real <laughs> talk, real so talk. I was under the radar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretending to be a Jamaican drug dealer. Man. Yeah. <laughs> man, that's crazy. That's crazy. It t it talking about Philly, Uh, I know y'all was cool at one point. Is, is you and me, Mill? Y'all back cool? I know y'all had yeah, an yeah, issue cool. for a minute. Yeah, you know we, what I'm saying? It was a little weird, you know, because, you know, we was real, real cool. And then even the, the issue that happened wasn't, I mean, it was nothing that, you know, because my thing, I would never try to do anything to destroy us to fuck up somebody's money. You know what I mean? I, I'm not the type that like, you know, and I I think that whole thing happened around the time he was beefing with uh, Drake. Yeah. You know? And uh, it was my, it was, a, it was a girl that I was dating at the time. She's a troublemaker, man. It's better to be careful who you date, man. Young woman will get you shot. <laughs> And I had a road troublemaker in my life. Man, man, you gotta be careful <laughs> you date. You know, so I remember I was dating this one chick, you know, fine chick, you know, and she, um, but she was a savage, and I don't think she liked Meek Mill as an artist or whatever. So I remember I had just went to a, 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 a Christmas benefit, you know, like tour drive in the, like in a projects or somewhere. Yeah. You know, it was me, Meek, and then the guy from um, Yes, Yes from um, what's that show? That show that was really hot on Fox with um Terrence Howard and um Terrence Empire Hansen. Empire okay so Yaz was their son he played that son on Empire yeah. he's with Philly or something yeah so I remember it was me him Meek 
you know, we had, it was like a toy drive or something, some kind of thing for Christmas in the projects. And I remember we all went, we took a picture. And then, um, and then I remember while I was, I was driving, we was on our way, I was driving back home. I told my lady, I said, hey, post this picture, you know, back. I, I try to keep it funny. Because at that t- moment, he was really going through it. You know, we, I mean, with that whole thing with Drake, Drake just destroyed him with that whole fucking rap song he made. Yeah, you know, I said I so, but he was also dating. I think dating Nikki at that time. Okay, I think so. I remember I said on the picture. I said, I said, I said, post this and say something, something, and say and me, whatever from Empire and Nikki's boyfriend. That's what I said. I don't even call him me. I said call Nikki Nikki's boyfriend. <laughs> trying to be funny, you know what <laughs> I mean? But instead, this motherfucker wrote, and a nigga that got destroyed by Drake. Instead, that's what she wrote. Yeah. And I didn't even know that. I'm just driving, you know, next thing my phone is going off. And it's like mixed people. They're like, yo, man, what the fuck is that you just posted? I'm like, what you mean I posted? I look, I'm like, I'm like, what the fuck you, what you do that for? These are my people. Like, you know, don't, you know, and I got to, I mean, we're no longer together, but that was, that yeah. was, you know, wrong. But at the same time, I couldn't been, I couldn't go be like, you know, hey, my girl did that. You know what I mean? Nah. I'd be like, you know, I, 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 I said, man, just a joke. You know what I mean? But I'm like, what the fuck you post that for? <laughs> you know, but I can't go. Fucking um, throw my girl in the bus. Nah, you know what I mean. I can't yeah. do that. Yeah. So I had to suck it up as if I just was trying to be funny when I it was nothing I would I would ever post because I'm not. Yeah, that's yeah. not what I do. This you know he's he's got my yeah he's going through some shit but you know you clown him but like not on not on the internet not in front of the whole world you know what yeah, I mean he clown yeah. behind back door behind the door like yo mate let nigga do that yeah you know so that's that's what happened and that's yeah. you know but they just they thought I was just being an asshole yeah yeah you know what yeah. I mean that's what happened but. We all that got squashed. Because good, good. Oh, it bang got squashed. That's years ago. Yeah. Because I remember, you know, um, it was something that involved fifty and everybody else, and I, I did some kind of, I said, I did something funny about it, and then Meek then reposted it, something like that. But nah, they, yeah. they, 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 they're my homies. You know, what I mean, I, that's what's up. And I, and the kid, man, you know, I always give him props because, you know, he came from absolute nothing. You know, what I mean, he came from nothing. Went the whole jail system, and then, you know, got on top of the world, and then Drake. Put a nigga down and a nigga fought his way back up, got back on top and yeah. fighting for, you know, prisoners and doing all that shit. I'm really, I was really impressed with what he's done. You know what I mean? So, nah, much love to Meek. Man, that's what's up. Shout out to Meek. Uh, so, so you working at Domino's Pizza, you know, around 14, 15, and someone uh, suggests that you do an open mic. You know, um, what led to your co-workers coming up to you and saying, Mike, do, do an open mic? That was that was after high school at this time. Okay. I, I graduated okay. high school. I was, you know, I was about, it's a, probably a couple of years after high school. I was probably like 19 years old. One of my coworkers, he was uh, he was he he worked there delivering part time because you know you make money every night, okay. making tips every night. Okay. But he was a full time um acting teacher at the Philadelphia Community College. Uh, Kevin London, that's his name, and he was like he just thought I was just funny, you know, whether I look funny or I just you know he just he's like Mike, go to open mic, man. Yeah. I said well, you know I said what is that about? He said it's open mic, it's a comedy night, you know, you just. Let me help you put your, you know, what you want to, what, tell me about your family. You know, let's put some five minute shit together. Yeah, yeah. And we, that's how I started going over my. That's what's up. That's what's up. And, and the first thing you was on was basically like an extra on Lean On Me. Well, Lean On Me was way before. That was when I was in Jersey. Okay, that, that was I, a while back. That before okay, I okay. Because I came, when I got to Philly, I was about 16. So this yeah, happened, yeah. Lean On Me happened at like 15 years old. Yeah. And how I got in Lean On Me was I was, um, I was such a smart kid in school. Yeah, during the summertime, you know, this is um, ninth, tenth grade, I think, tenth, yeah, because I came to Philly eleventh grade. Yeah. So this is like tenth grade, ninth or tenth grade, during the summertime, all those that had good grades were invited to go to a pre-college program during the summertime. Okay. So all the local colleges in Newark, New Jersey, we had like NJIT, we had um, uh, Rutgers. And then um, U- University of Medicine Industries. So it was three colleges that we all had a choice of picking which one we want to go to. Uh-huh. And then, um, so we were there for the summer, and that's when they started filming the movie Lean On Me. And they invited all the kids to become extra in this movie from the pre-college program. Yeah, yeah, that's dope. That's how I ended up in it. I was, I was way up. Comedy was not even on, in my thoughts. I was trying to be an accountant wow. at that time or a doctor or something. That's what I wanted to be at one point. Wow. You know, all that got shut down because when I, you know, when I graduated high school, I figured that I still had to help my family make money. So I had to keep working. So I couldn't even go and do no college. 
Man, that's crazy, man. You know, hey, and look how God worked. Look yeah, how, dude. look where you at now. Yes, you know, sir. I know the first movie I saw you on uh, was a movie called uh, Repo with Master P. Uh, how how did you get on that uh, movie? And um, you know, what connected you and P to you know work together on that? Well, P, um, Repo came after Next Friday. Okay, that was okay. Yeah, Next Friday was my first big. Well, <laughs> Lean on Me was like well, I was an extra way before I even thought I'd be by being an entertainer. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then Next Friday came about, and then you know, when we go to Repo, so I could think. Well, Next Friday was over. Next Friday came out like two thousand, and then when it came out, I became like an instant hood star. Yeah, I mean, I became like a ghetto fabulous star. Every black person knew who I was, you know. Facts. So then I was all of a sudden went from five hundred dollars a show to like twenty five hundred dollars a show. I'm traveling all these clubs and colleges across the country, you know, making money. The African dude from Next Friday, that's what they called me. The African yeah. nigga from Next Friday. Yeah. You know. And then, you know, and I rode that wave for a very long time. When the wave had died, you know, because everything nothing lasts forever. When the wave died, that's when I said, okay, let me, maybe it's time to like, let me move to LA and see what's going on. Okay. So I remember moving here for a very short time, like um, 2005-ish, around that time. And then these guys had wrote a, a few movies and they were trying to find Master P. Um, but they found me first. And when they found me, you know, I think for somehow I was able to find Master P. Okay. And, you know, they wrote these movies all around me. They like, you know, Reaper was written for, I mean, when I read the script, like, it had all my scenes in it, yeah. you know, and when it got Master P, it's like, okay, boom, let's make it happen. And it was, you know, I think Master P was trying to make it come back into movies at the time, because I know he did some stuff in the late 90s, you know, but now he were to go back and do it again, Yeah, you know, so we got together, we, you know, we all got together, and we decided to do this movie, and believe you know, I pretty much... At that point, I was so involved in comedy, I was like, you know, I end up casting the whole movie. Damn. The only one I didn't cast was Cat Williams, and Master P just called that, you know, called it himself and got him. Yeah. But everybody else that was in Repo, I made that phone call and casted the whole movie. That's crazy. Yeah, and that was one of my favorite movies, oh, man. man. You I'm had me bring that dying. Back, dead and alive with balls in my hands. Two coffees to go. <laughs> Bitch, you look like me. <laughs> D-U-D, boss, that nigga is dead. <laughs> Yeah, no, nah, that shit. That was a hit. That was a hit, man. You know, uh, sometime after that, you did the uh, Master P present. Was it like uh, Hood Stars of Comedy? Yeah. Was that right after that? Yeah, yeah. Right after so Repo? after we did that, we did a few things together. We even did another thing called Black Superman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Master P was a Superman. Yeah. Right? You probably know I saw that. You ain't missing nothing, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. He could have just shot that shit with an iPhone, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Oh, hold on. I'm filming a movie. I call me back, motherfucker. <laughs> but um, yeah, we did the Master P presents. We did uh, Black Superman, and was it something else? Was that your biggest stand up up to that point? Um, doing that with Master P? Um, uh, nah, I did. I did a few years prior to that. I did a few things with Comic View. Yeah, you know, I was on. A, I was a regular on BT. Okay, time, you know, um, I know. I, my first time on BT was when I first started, which was like '94, and that's when it was like a competition back then. Gotcha. So I remember, like, you know, I flew to L.A., cost me a hundred, you know, the only, p the only paying comedians $150. You had to fly yourself in, get your own hotel, you know, and I remember coming out to L.A. for the first time in, like, 94 to do that competition. Yeah. Damn. To do that. But that was my, you know, and then I lost. So and then when you lose, you go back home. And then um, then when um, from, the, from the time the movie came out, from 99 on, whatever, I was doing Comedy View almost every year. So I, I try to keep myself on TV. Gotcha. And, so, and that's, you, gotta, you gotta find a way to keep yourself relevant, you know, yeah. till social media came out in 2009, and then we jumped on something else. Yeah, real talk. To keep yourself relevant. Yeah, that's what's up, you know. Talking about uh, stand-up and stand-up comedians, one of the biggest stand-up comedians right now in this generation, of course, is Kevin Hart. You know, at one point, you and Kevin had a small little, you know, beef or issue, whatever. I believe it started from a video uh, you did uh, talking about his cheating scandal. Um, but I'd rather hear from you, like, kind of what happened with that situation. Um... <sighs> So you know what you know I I was just talking about this not too long ago and I remember um you know when it came out I think everybody was ready to you know he's a comedian and you know, you do, you you are definitely you used to making fun of people now is is your turn you know um you know, people thought I made if I didn't make fun of him cheating I just make fun of how he explained himself because I think at at that point 
before we found out he cheated, you know, he was trying to explain himself. And then I was like, nigga, you snitching on yourself. You know, I started making videos and like, no, no, don't tell him, don't say nothing. Yeah, we let him find out on their own. You know, babe, he, you know, he felt like, I mean, because everybody, even some of his friends made fun of him. He just felt like I just did it too much and kept going. And that's how I go hard and I just keep going. I ride it. You know, I light niggas up. I don't, I don't slow down. <laughs> Yeah. But I didn't know, you know, because my thing, you know, if he had a problem, I felt like he'd have picked up the phone like, hey, Mike, you know what I mean? He could have called me. I'd be like, all right, Cap, I got you, man. Yeah. But, you know, I figured he didn't pick up the phone and call. And I, I didn't think it was a problem. Man, that's crazy. That's crazy. I know in the interview uh, you said that you and Kevin was actually, like, uh, locked up before together. Oh, I was like, is, is that serious? Like, that's serious. <laughs> all locked up together, man. And, 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 and the funny thing about it, all that shit happened. It happened in 99 was when I was supposed to flew back out to L.A. to audition for next Friday. Yeah. So the day, so like now, nah, maybe a couple of weeks, a week or so before I was supposed to fly out, before I was supposed to fly back to L.A. to audition for next Friday, we were taking a trip to New York. Me, Kevin Hart, another comedian named Ture Gordon, and another guy named Buck Wild. We had, a, we had a guy in Philly called Buck Wild. He was all comedians. We were going to New York from Philly to do a show. And uh, we all decided to get in Buck's car. We all met in one place and get in, hopped in one car. We got in the wrong nigga's car, put it that way. What? This nigga, Buck is like the fakest, this guy, this is how bad this guy. This guy would sell you. This guy sold me a fake Rolex watch and had me on a payment plan. <laughs> oh, Everything man. Buck has is not <laughs> real. You know, if you don't get in his car, better research that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got in this nigga's car and he... So, you know, he had a, what happened was he had a license plate that somebody had reported stolen because that's what we did back in the day in Philly. If I get a license, if I get a lot of tickets in my car, I don't want to get my car towed. So what I do, I report, my, I report my license plate stolen and I get a new plate. Yeah, yeah. So the plate he had was a plate that was reported stolen by somebody else because <laughs> he didn't want to go through the whole process of registering his car. He just took somebody's plate that he gave him and he put on his car. So now if the police read that plate, they just see... They just read stolen property. So they don't know if it's a car stolen, they don't know whatever. Yeah. We're on the, on the highway, on the turnpike from Philly to New York. And right at, around the time we got to Newark, New Jersey, state trooper pulls us over and hands up, guns out, all of that shit crazy. And I was, yeah. and then this idiot made me drive, he had me driving. Yeah. So now, you know, it was ugly. We all ended up getting locked up and. You know, it was it was man. a funny situation too. It's, it's another story, man. Like everybody. <laughs> You know, but yeah, but that's how that's how I ended up being locked up. And the thing about it, the day, so the day I had to go to audition, the day I had to fly out was the day who we had to go to court. Damn. So me and Kev was the only one that went to court, and then we you know court court's nine a.m. and I was booked on a one fifty p.m. flight in Philly. Yeah. So we drove out to woke up like six a.m. went to Newark, New Jersey, went to court at nine a.m. got out of there at ten o'clock, drove back to Philly in time for me to catch my one fifty p.m. flight. Man. That's crazy, man. Yeah. You know, so Kev, you know, it, it, I mean, we, I, we always love each other as a brother. You know, what I mean, it was just, mm -hmm. you know, it was just a little something, a little, little misunderstanding, nothing yeah. serious. Like I said, if I felt like he would have been like, "Hey, Mike, you roasting me too much, nigga. I'm going through some shit." Yeah, Chill. Yeah. I would understood, but he, you know, I felt like I probably felt at that time like he didn't really fucking with me anyway, so it don't matter. Yeah, you know, so I don't, gotcha. I, I light this nigga up. Yeah, y'all squashed it though, right? No, no, you know, we good. How, uh, how did y'all squash it? You know, uh, you know, we ran into each other at the um because you know niggas we comedian like I said we fight online. We wonder what you do when you run into each other, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we ran into each other at a at a playoff game in Philly. Okay, okay. You know, and then we like talked a little bit about you know we we thought we squashed it. You know we, and then um you know we put up a picture. We you know we took a picture and I put it up at I think my my caption on the picture felt like we're still beefing. <laughs> so we had to re we had to remake up again. <laughs> oh man, yeah, man. y'all like talking about it. Look, man, we got to make this. You know, <laughs> we got to make this look better, man. Yeah, but we we yeah, yeah. we good. My That's what's brother. up. That's what's up. You know, and, and I have to mention this, man. You you talked about you know talking about Philly. I heard you mention it, uh, on an interview, man, that uh you know uh I guess seventy six or Ben Simmons, who is your boy, mm -hmm. he actually like uh 
you know, hit on your wife and everything like fiance. that. Your fiance, yeah. you know, and everything like that. And uh, you know, y'all not cool no more because of that. Like, did this like really happen? I know yeah. you joke a lot, man. Not, I'd be like, I don't know what nah, to take and what really happened. Man. Okay, okay. This, this nigga, you know, it, <laughs> these dudes, man. They, you know, the thing about it, they could have, you know, the NBA players. A lot of them is just corny ass dudes. Yeah, They're corny. They can't. <laughs> Don't know how to holler at chicks. You know what I'm saying? They don't know how to holler at chicks. They don't know how they don't understand how a funny looking nigga like me could holler because women at the end of the day wants to laugh. I could go I could holler at any woman. If yeah. Rihanna and them, uh, if, if they were single, I I wouldn't know a comedian would know how to go and holler to her. But a lot of these you know, hundred and eighty million dollar dudes, they just they just got the money. They they have no swag. Yeah. And he's one of them dudes with no swag and don't know how to I've actually hooked this nigga up with chicks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The whole time he iron my chick because he feel like if he could get her, I could get her too, probably. You know. So yeah, he's. I mean, since then, look what's happening. He's now being all star. He can't make a layup anymore. You know, the voodoo is on his ass right now. Damn. And now all his homies are gone. <laughs> he don't know. KD Ky- just got Kyrie left. KD is gone. He just him and a, a few bench warmers, man. That's it. <laughs> you will never win a championship, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm, I hope they trade him to the to Shanghai Sharks, wherever, wherever, wherever <laughs> plays in China. Trade Ben to the Chinese team. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, t- I called man. the village, man. I said, put something on this, this light skin <laughs> nigga. Oh, the village, man. <laughs> and that's crazy because you see, just see things oh, he's happening. Done. Over- <laughs> he's, he's, he's done, man. Everybody's clowning him, man. You see, that's what you get, man. You're not a, you know, oh, man. You're not a genuine person. <laughs> Pretend to be my friend and you were trying to holler at somebody, girl. You, he's old kid, man. Grow up, mother sucker. Yeah. I would light man. him up for the rest of his life, you know. That's crazy. That's I crazy. Him, so I see him go the other way and go back online. That's, you know, I, all my fights are online, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> you ain't lying. <laughs> you see me in person, I'm calling the cops. <laughs> Police officer, didn't you guy trying to fight me? I'm seeing you online, nigga. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, st- staying on the relationship side of things, you know, uh, in the past, you know, who knows if it's real or not, you know, you had, you know, scandals and stuff like that out there. But you, you mentioned that you don't believe in monogamy and all of that. So, uh, is, is that true? You don't believe no, in that? No, no. Or I'm not believing it. It's just that you know, it just I'm just got a problem keeping my dick in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, I'm the one with the problem, man. and it's it, monogamy is a real thing. You could be, and I didn't realize that till late in my life. You know, I've had some really great relationship, dated some wonderful woman and broke all their hearts because my dick wanted to do his own damn thing. This nigga don't listen to me. Man. That's I put crazy. him to the side. My nigga dick, stop acting retarded, okay? <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but as you know, when I got, when, when I broke up with my last relationship before my lady now, I was like, um, you know, I told her, I said, listen, I don't know how to, I'm not, I'm not even gonna lie to you. I've, I've been single for a year and it's been the best thing for me. Yeah. You know, where I'm not have to lie to nobody. I'm not cheating, I'm not doing nothing. So if you wanna come and be in a relationship with me, this is what it comes with. Yeah. You know, so you have to accept it or that or just, you know, because, and sometimes they just, you know, women, they'll feel like, you know, maybe he just feeling this way right now, he change later. Uh, Facts. Let's, let's see what happens in 30 yeah. years, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I, I don't, I don't know if this is is really out there or not, and everything like that. But you, you got it, you got a sex tape out there too. You know, yeah. that's like kind of yeah, <laughs> like man. I heard of yeah. something. Yeah. It's flo- floating around there. It's, it's, it, you know what I mean? It, it is. It, it was not no sex tape. Somebody just, you know, somebody just recorded my private without me knowing. Like they must have the phone of the little camera thing on there as a watch or something. Damn, that's what happened. That's probably what happened. You know, but. The thing about it is, like, that one, I, you know, it went pretty far in, like, you know, in some, like, a, we had, like, a little thing case, so I can't, I can't really talk about that because we had, okay. had a, okay. you know, but, yeah, it's, it's out there somewhere, but, you know, it's, man. Uh, we good, yeah. Okay, I mean, as long as you're good, Yeah, man, I'm good, you know, man. So. The thing about it, you know, I wasn't too embarrassed. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm African, you know, I have the Mutombo dick, so... <laughs> If a motherfucker put my dick out and it came out looking like Spud Web or some little ass, you know, Vienna Vienna sausage, I've been pissed. I'm suing everybody. But, yeah. you know, my I have I give up blood infections, so I'm not, I wasn't worried too much about, when they came out, I'm like, you know, it's not a bad thing, it's just more publicity, who cares? Yeah, real talk, real talk. 
<laughs> so uh, we'll get off of that. Yeah, let's get off my dick. Right <laughs> so going back to your story, <laughs> in uh, 2011, uh, you had the opportunity to do stand up with, with Martin on Showtime. Um, another one of the greatest stand up comedians. Um, my favorite, my favorite stand up comedians is Martin and Cat Williams and yourself. You know, what was it like working with Martin on that? Oh God, it's like it's like that's all part of your dreams coming true. I remember being, I remember being a new comedian, 19, 20 years old. Yeah. Maybe twenty one at the comedy club in Philly, and Martin Lawrence comes there for the weekend, and he just that little guy that just admired him. Damn, you, you know, it, it was in before he even did Martin show. He just I think he just did Star Search, and then he did uh do the right thing. Oh, you know what I mean? Do the right thing. Like, yeah. No, no, no. Martin, Martin don't do the right. Yeah, thing. Martin was to do the right thing. Is that do that? Okay. Oh, no, not no, do the right no. thing. What's that movie? Yeah, uh-huh. do the right thing with Spike Lee. Martin ain't on that. Yes. Martin is okay, okay, yeah, okay. Now nah, I'm off. Dang. Yeah, I guess I'm that's too when, young, man. You yeah, know what I'm saying? <laughs> See, that's when comedians, like, man, you get a cameo in a movie like this, you was a star back then. Yeah, yeah. And Martin was a star. I'm like, dang, that's the guy who did the right thing. And, yeah. You know, and then, you know, we watching him, like, you know, I'm just a, just a new comic, just come and hang out. Hopefully the club manager will let me in so I can watch Martin and at least say hi and shake his hand, whatever. Yeah. And even had a chance to, like, go out and eat with him after the show, you know. Um, just. Dope. It's been an open mic comic, you know what I mean? And then you fast forward to like, now you get to work with this guy. Yeah. All dreams come true, man, you know? And then, you know, like even now when I go in and I'm headlining a place and I see the new guys come out and they want to meet me and I'm like, damn, that's how it was for me yeah. 25 years Matt ago. Matt Martin. When I, you know, people, when, yeah. when I want to meet the headliner and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. So got a ch- you know, getting a chance to work with people you looked up to was very wonderful. And then, you know, they got to... You know, and it, this whole time they they didn't know about you. Cause these guys, you know, Martin knew who I was, and he was a fan. Yeah. You know, even same thing with Eddie. Even before I worked with Eddie, I remember I ran into him at the. Uh, I met one time. I think one time Chris Tucker was doing something at the comedy store, and I remember I went stop through there, and then Eddie was there. Yeah. You know, check him out. And I remember after the show was outside. And I went and spoke to Eddie. He said, like, oh, I know you, the African mother sucker. And I'm like, oh, shit, this guy know who I am. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it just so, it feel good when when people you look up to, you know, admire what you're doing and invite you to come and work with them. You know, dope, dope, dope. I know you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, I just mentioned him as one of my uh, also favorite stand-up comedians, and he was on Next Friday with you, you know, uh, Cat Williams. I know at one point in time you had, you know, issues with him too because you said, I guess he was on crack or something, or you said something like that. <laughs> what what was it that, that happened with you and Cat that yeah. kind of like deterred you two relationship? No, no, he, uh, Kat, I was in Next Friday. Cat was in Friday after Next. But, yeah, you yeah. know, but we knew, you know, we were comedians. The thing with comic comedians, we all know each other. Yeah, yeah. You know, we all started grinding the same time. Like when I saw Mike, on, when we, me and Mike was on set up Next Friday, we, we, we had like a five year chemistry. Yeah. So it's easy to balance jokes up for each other. You know, and same thing with Cat. Me and Cat was in um, freaking Repo together. You know, that was our first movie we did together exactly, in 2005 yeah. when we did that. And then we yeah. later on did two more movies. Um, at least one Meet the Blacks the second one mm-hmm. yeah um, yeah so um, you know the thing with Cat it was like a, it was like um, it was like me giving him flowers and then it turned into like a, I guess it, you know or like most of my compliments <laughs> sometimes come with a little insult but I don't be thinking about it I was just I was more like giving this guy his flowers when it, it just came out the wrong way mm-hmm. because I remember I was you know I was talking about I was, you know, was talking about comedians and, you know, you know, what it takes for comedians to be great or, you know, likable. And I was you know, I remember I was saying, Hey, you know, I said to be a great comedian, man, to survive, you gotta be lovable. Motherfuckers gotta love you regardless. Yeah. I said, Cat is probably one of the most lovable comedians in the whole world. What I meant to say what I meant to say, because at the time we always we people always think something wrong with Cat, oh, he low off, he this, he does, you know, I'm getting beat up by kids and you know, with his, his charges, and you know, it, even when at one point when he, um, you know, when he has started to slow down after his his became a star, he went a, he went on stage and he would go struggling on stage. Yeah. So people always thought something was wrong with Cat. You know what I mean? Um, and and I remember in an interview I said, you know, um, I don't care what you, Cat is the most lovable comedian in the world, regardless of how much crack y'all think he smoke. And what I really meant to say, I'm a crack, but I think that's I think. Okay, I, instead of saying that, I think I said, because how much crash he smokes, I've said it wrong. 
<clears throat> so he came out as if I thought he was a crackhead. And I didn't mean that. I just meant, like, I don't care what y'all think about Cat. Cat's the most lovable comedian in the world. Yeah. I don't care how much crack y'all think that nigga smoke or getting beat up by little kids or whatever shit he's going through. Cat is probably the most lovable of all. Uh-huh. So then when that came out, it's like, oh, Mike saying Cat a cat. Cat is a crackhead, but I'm, I never saw Cat do no damn crack. Yeah, yeah. I know some do drugs in life. Cat's yeah. a fucking legend. Yeah, you know what I'm saying it uh, just came out wrong, but we, we, we squatch that as well. Okay, okay. You know, uh, also, you know, I, I believe, you know, when it come down, to especially us as black men, but y'all in the comedy world, it's kind of like, do you kind of see that as y'all being competitive sometimes too? When like y'all continue the the jokes. <laughs> You know, yeah. like the situation with you and Kevin or you and Kat. Mm-hmm. Y'all end up becoming cool again, but do you think being competitive has something to do with it too? Um, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know what? At the end of the day, man, that's what the people like. People don't like. People want beef. America mm-hmm. love beef. They love, you know, because that's what sells. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, like deep inside, I'm like, you know, this is my homie. I'm not about to keep continuing this shit for, you know what I mean, when it's not necessary. But world loves beef. Yeah. Beef. So I'm be honest with you, you know what I mean? And like, you know, I mean, you, and a lot of these rappers, sometimes they purposely keep the beef on, even though they're made up, just so they could both sell. Because people are curious to what this guy going to say about him. People just want to come on stage to see what you're going to say about this person. Yeah, yeah. Because America loves beef, you know. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I don't know if we, I'm going to say, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. I mean, sometimes, you know, yeah, it's a competitional thing. It is. But the thing with, with comedy, man, I think we're all so different in our own way that we're not really competing against each other. We're all different. Like, I'm different from Kevin Wim, Ke- Kevin Hart. I'm Gosh. different from Cat Williams. You know, we could all be in a movie together and it's three different people. Yeah, you man. know, um, I'm not competing with those guys. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm so very successful, especially from where I come from. With success, is not always about you know, how great somebody else is doing. It's how yeah. well have you became, you know, uh-huh. how better you got. Uh-huh. As long as, you know, as long as you're stepping up the ladder to, on your own, on your own, that's success. You know, yeah. like, you don't know what that person did to get where he is, you know. Yeah. You don't know, you know what I mean? So just do things your way. Real and that's how I've always done things my way. I never, like, you know, I'm, I'm African. I'm not even from this country. I can't go, you know, I can't. This is their country. I'm just happy to be here. And to make it in this land is hard. It's hard. Yeah. But come out from another country and make it. So I'm very happy where I am. Yeah, real talk, real talk. And I know you a jokester, you know, anyways. You know, you joke about a lot of stuff. I even know uh, one time you mentioned that, uh, I guess Tyrese called the cops on you or something like that. Was, was that true? Oh, like, no, no. was that I, a joke too? No. That, so that was, that whole, no, nah, he, didn't, he didn't call the cops. The cops, people thought I was really kidnapped by Tyrese. They thought Tyrese, Tyrese <laughs> lost his mind. So, you know, and even with that, we had the whole world food. We fooled America. Uh, I, it's so okay. funny you mentioned Tyrese. I was just with Tyrese yesterday. We hung out yesterday. He okay. had some little event, and I went to it last night. Okay. But so what happened was this. Um, I guess it was around the time I created this thing called the Dark Skin Committee. You know, <laughs> and it was like, I'm part of the Dark Skin Committee, Wesley Snipes, you know, Morris Chestnut, Tyrese. Don Cheeto, you know, Flavor Flav. And everybody, everybody had a job, you know. I'm okay. like, I'm the CEO of the Dawson Committee. <laughs> Tyrese is probably the treasurer. Wesley Snipes is the Minister of Defense. You know, Flavor Flav was Minister of Agriculture. Whatever title everybody had. Yeah. So I had this Dawson Committee thing going on. And then not too long after that, Tyrese went through his situation with his child support thing. Remember that whole thing? What more do you want from me? Remember yeah, that whole thing? yeah. <laughs> You know, so I was watching it, you know, and I'm like, okay, this guy's part of the Dawson committee, you know. He's, he's he's bitching too much right now. Stop crying, Tyrese, okay. So he made one video, you know, and another video, another video. I'm like, one more video, Tyrese. I'm going to have to get you out of this Dawson committee. Yeah. And another video came out, another crying video. I'm like, okay, that's it. You know, this nigga's out of the Dawson committee, right? Yeah. So <laughs> when that happened, it, a, a mutual friend kind of like connected us together to do something funny. Okay. So I went to his house and then we made all this fake kidnap thing where people really, and we put on, we had an IG. People thought I was really kidnapped. And his wow. dog, he had his dog involved in it. You know what <laughs> I mean? It was like real crazy. You know, and then, you know, and then, um, Damn. 
all of a sudden, you know, it was acting like it was doing on my phone, like I was live on my phone, and all of a sudden, boom, my phone goes off. Nobody hears from Mike. Damn. They think Tyrese lost his mind. You know, you got the dog there. <laughs> Mike is tied up. So, TM, and then somebody called the police. Wow. Helicopter went at his house. But by that time, I was already home. I'm home Damn. already. So, helicopter is at his house. You know, TMZ got involved. And then, um, so we just, I'm like, okay, these motherfuckers think it's real. So, they were calling. I don't pick up. TMZ trying to reach me. I'm, I don't pick up the phone. Let them think I'm really kidnapped. You know, and then we just kept playing along with it. And then I remember we went to go eat somewhere. And then, you know, he had me like, had me like tied up, whatever, while I went to the restaurant. And it was funny <laughs> shit. Yeah. Man. <laughs> we fooled America. Man. Y'all took it all the way, huh? All the way. <laughs> That's funny, man. That's <laughs> funny, man. <laughs> man. So uh, going back to your uh, stand up a little bit, um, you know. Well, talking about stand up, uh, we probably have one of the first, you know, rappers turned uh, comedian now doing stand up. Ti, um, as one of the great stand up comedians, how do you feel about him now becoming a comedian, and what do you think about what he's doing as a comedian? Um, you know, hey, this is America, man. You know, you do whatever it is. It's, this country just allow you to become. You know, you can venture into different things. Look at Michael Jordan, was a basketball player, then he started playing baseball. He was a golfer. Yeah, you know. Um, and the thing about it with comedy, you just have to have something to talk about. And I think Tia has a lot to talk about. I mean, we follow him this, you know, from a very young age and all the stuff he's went through. And, and he's been talking about that on stage. I haven't seen him perform in a while. It's been a while since I've seen him perform, you know. But I was impressed. I'm like, you know. Okay. But, I, you know, one thing I did tell him, I said, hey, it's just, you know, because the thing about him, he's, you know, he's a headliner, you know, as a musician. But I'm like, with comedy, Tia, I just be a host. Go MC the show. There's no pressure when you're an MC. Yeah. You know, you just go up there, tell a couple of jokes, bring on the next comedian, tell jokes in between. He's like, nah, man, I'm gonna be hell on my but you want you know. So I'm yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, it's gonna be t- it's gonna be some tough times. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're gonna you're not always gonna go to a stage where they're gonna always be your fans, motherfuckers. These yeah. motherfuckers came to hear some comedy, some jokes. Yeah. And them jokes ain't coming back to back to back to back to back. Who knows what will happen? It's when shit happened in New York. Yeah, yeah. You know, he got caught. He caught out. He caught it out there at the Barclays Center one night. You know, so. Yeah. And it, you know, it, all, all that do is just make you greater, though. And, you know, he's just a competitive person. Yeah. He can be whatever he wants to be. Yeah. yeah. That's what's up. That's what's up. So uh, eventually, you start working on Wild and Out. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Probably one of the funniest, uh, you know, improv shows ever. To be real, uh, you know, what, what made you um go and start wilding out and um, what landed you there? Oh man, I, you know, I'm gonna go back to 2005 when I first moved back to moved to LA, and I remember they were auditioning for Wilding Out, and I wasn't good enough. Wow, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't, you know, and um, so I'm like, okay, that's fine, you know. They're going, they're going to want me one day. And then, and, I, and I went back home. That's when I, you know, I went back, back to the East Coast, 2006, and then 2009. Social media came out, and I'm on social media, killing it and growing my following. You know, my following just growing and growing, and I'm just standing out and more and more. And then here I am, going from, from going to being like, you know, a cast member to now. They like, I didn't have to audition anymore. They called me like, hey, Mike, we need to be, come be a special guest on the show mm. because I had made such an impact on social media. And then my first time doing it, I was supposed to just went and did like one or two shows. Nick like, oh my, you want to do three for me? You want to do a couple more? You want to do more? You want to do more? You know, and um, it, you know, it went from just, um, because I guess, you know, they realized, I guess, you know, sometimes, you know, it just got, it's always best when, when God says your time, it is your time, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And I guess at that time, it wasn't meant for me to be a normal regular cast member, but now I'm a special guest on the show. Now I'm a captain, yeah. and I'm, you know, now I'm, I'm showing more respect. Real you know, and I just, from the first couple of times I've done it, and I kill it, and then they just, they love me being on there. Not only I'm, I'm probably an easy target to roast. Don't get it wrong, I'm an easy roast target. So then, you yeah. know, make it easy on themselves. Bring Michael Blackson back on. Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna light their asses up too. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So it's been fun. In fact, I got three new episodes coming out that I did on the new season. So That's what's up. That. That's dope. That's dope. You you ever get on Nick having all them damn kids, man? Yeah. Man, <laughs> god damn, Nick. I, I told that nigga, I said, Nick, Nick, I said, this guy must have like a threesome and whoever get pregnant first is the winner, motherfucker. <laughs> okay, this guy, I said, you gonna run out of names for these kids soon. Man. You gonna start calling them niggas by numbers. Hey, number 12, come here. 
13, stop that. 69, get that out of your face. 45, put it down. Man. Number 11, you too old for this shit. Get man. <laughs> Go run out of kids' name, man. I know when y'all see each other, it's just always a joke session. You Every gotta, time, you gotta man. Be ready, man. Every because time. Be around comedians, and you, you, as soon as you hit the, man, you you hit around you 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 pull up around a bunch of comedians, man. Just be prepared. Yeah. Either yeah. start roasting because they're already sizing you up. Yeah, yeah. That's how it is. <laughs> you, you you go to the comedy club on a night like a Monday night at the Improv or, you know, any night at the comedy store, the Laugh Factory, and those comedy night where comedians just hanging out. Yeah, yeah. Be ready. Oh, it's over. It's yeah, over. Um, you know, I, I was in the front row uh, of a show when Mike Epps was there before, and it was me, my my Persian girl at the time, and then her two friends who were mixed too. And Mike Epps just kept on looking at it. He was like, y'all look like a, a episode of MTV Real World or some shit like that. <laughs> he was, he would not stop clouding on us, oh, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, so you got to be ready you gotta be when prepared. you're around comedians, yeah, man. Real talk. Man. And when I go on stage, that's the first thing I do. I just go in. And I set the tone right away. Like yeah. I'm about to, you know, I set the tone, like lighting everybody up. Yeah. Uh, make everybody pay attention to me because now you know not to say some shit <laughs> in, the, in between my shows because you will be part of my show, motherfucker. It's over. And it's you over. ain't paid but me, my nigga. <laughs> That's what's up. That's what's up. Uh, so eventually you was able to get on one of the biggest anticipated movies of all time coming to America. Uh, now I know you told the story a little bit, but it sounded like you kind of, you you made your presence known to get on that movie. But but explain, how did you get on coming to America? Ah, so this is how I got on. I mean, like I say, um, it's so, I, I saw a video a long, long time ago where Eddie, way before they even decided on doing this movie, you know, the people was interviewing Eddie in Arsenio Hall. Like, hey man, you guys gonna do coming to America? And I was sitting there, was like joking around. He said, "Oh yeah, yeah, they're gonna have Michael Blackson, Eddie Murphy." Like, okay, now you you telling jokes or whatever. Mm -hmm. That video is out there, so, you know. So it's so funny. So what happened was when they decided to do the movie. I remember um, TMZ ran into Akon and said, "Hey Akon, man, you know, Eddie them doing another Come to America. Man. How you feel about that?" He said, "You know, it's a good idea. They just better just get some real Africans in this movie. Yeah. Please get some real Africans." Yeah. So then TMZ ran into Eddie Murphy and said, hey, Eddie Murphy, um, Akon said I should get some real Africans in this movie. And Eddie was like, well, I know one funny African, Michael Blackson. Yeah. When he mentioned my name, I'm like, okay, uh, well, let me call my agent. Hey, I think Eddie won me in this movie, man. Y'all just figured out, get in touch with him. And yeah. that's how it all happened. Dope. And when I got on set, you know, Eddie and um, Arsenio was like, hey, when we read this part, this part was written for you. Uh, wow. Yeah. That's amazing, man. And Eddie is one of the guys who you really look up, looked oh, up to, yeah, you know, man. coming up in the game and everything yeah, like that, right? My first comedian that I saw, and, you know, uh, he made me laugh as, as a little kid, you know, from when I was like 14, 15 years old. First time I saw stand-up comedy was when Eddie was like raw and delirious. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then got a chance to work with him. Like, God, this is all a dream come true. Man, that's little amazing. Kid from a village. That's and amazing. Nothing into a shelter home, and then I look, working with everybody you dream about. Man. Hey, nothing to something, man. You know what I'm saying? Real talk. You know, you know, you know, Mike. You you know, you put in a lot of work to get to where you at. You know, it wasn't just no pop up, and now everybody know you. Um, you know, but now you see some of the people. Let's say like a Charleston White who like just blew up overnight. You know, got everyone laughing and very popular on social media. I want to know, like, when it come to you know people like that, like Charleston White. What are your thoughts on just seeing somebody like that just blow up and, and just as popular as maybe somebody like you now? You know. Well, things that come fast, you know, you still got to put in work, you know. I mean, you know, people that come out, blow up that fast, could go down that fast as well. Mm -hmm. You know, when you put in that longevity and that long-term work, it's, that's what really lasts long. You know, with stand-up, man, it's a long process, you know what I mean? And it's, you know, a lot of these social media guys, you know, some get it and some don't. You know, you got to put in work. Like, you know, DC Young Fly is a social media kid that put in work. Yeah. Been on stage for like Talk. ten years, you know. Yeah. I remember the first time me and I roast, we roasted each other like 2013, 2014. Wow! So you got to put in work, you know. Yeah, so yeah. If, if you don't, I mean, it's you know, you get this one, you shine temporarily, you know, but to last long, you know, yeah. it takes time. Yeah, yeah. Know? So it's all good. I mean, thank God for this new way of blowing up now. You know, just go and build up, do some skits, build a fan base, you know. I mean, thank God it's easier now. It was hard in my era. You know, you had to, yeah. for you to be known, you had to get, get on television. It was yeah. hard to get on TV. 
Yeah. Back in the 90s and all of that. Yeah, real so, talk, real talk. Are you a fan of like Charleston White and, and what he doing? Who's, who's Charleston White? Is that the one that's like, that's the guy that- well, who get on everybody's, everybody's nerves. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I've never been to his, I've never seen his stand up. You know, I mean, I see little clips here of him, you know, the whole thing with him snitching a rapper guy, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know much about him. You know, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I didn't, I didn't know his last name was White. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't even know his last name. I was heard Charles. I knew. Yeah, yeah. Charles, but I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. That's funny, but uh, you know. I did a, I, you see it like on the wall, I did a show called The City, a series and everything like that, you know, and uh, I had this guy who came in and uh, he played a role in it and he kept mentioning, hey, you know, Michael Blackson is my cousin, man. Michael Blackson is my cousin, like, and his name is Michael too, you know, uh, so I, I want to, I want, it's only like 30 seconds, I want to show you this little clip that he did on my show, The City, mm -hmm. and just tell me like if you recognize you know who this dude is, and we gonna just play well, really quick. He ain't got quick. no cousins. <laughs> he, this, he, he said he's no cousin, man. So I'm gonna play real quick. Where is he at? He's in the state, in LA. Uh, let me see. Let me turn it up. Yeah, he's in LA. Now. I don't know that nigga. You don't know who he is? Hell no. He said he was your cousin. How the fuck he's my cousin? <laughs> oh, we started a family. First of all, all my family members could see these two niggas are blind. <laughs> you know my. I don't know. This nigga. <laughs> Plus, if 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 if, 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 if complexion was a time, he's 10 p.m. I'm like 11:59. We're not even in the same category. He said, I swear, Michael Blackson is my cousin. I don't know this nigga, man. I'm not related to him. All Africans are not related. <laughs> hey, I just, I just had to show you because it's like, yeah, if you ever if you ever meet him, tell him. He's my cousin. That's what he kept well, telling us, Tell man. the nigga he met me I'm not his cousin. <laughs> All right, I got you. I got you. Hey, I just I just had to show you that, though, man. You know what I'm saying? I had to. <laughs> I had to show you. <laughs> Where you met this nigga at, man? <laughs> <laughs> he came for an audition, man. Oh, okay. He came for an audition and everything like for that. Your show? Came, well, it's, it's a series we did called oh. The City. You know what I'm saying? You know, based in Los Angeles and everything like that. But uh, but yeah, when he came for the audition, he kept on. He, I'm telling you, he was kept on mentioning that. Yeah, yeah, we come, we come from. You know, where you from and everything like that. And, you know, and everything, so. I just had to, you know, show you just to make sure, well, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, so Mike, you working on a movie, you know, right now uh, that you're producing and everything, right? Well, I'm about to, I haven't started okay. yet. I've, um, I'm working on a few things right now. Um, well, one, I can't, you know, I. One, I can't even talk about it. It's a TV okay. show, I can't talk about it yet. They will not let me talk about it, but I have, I have, I have something that works. Okay, okay. You know, it's gonna I, be gonna be big something. Yeah, it's sitcom. Okay. It's oh, nice, nice. Know, it's in the work. I can't talk about it. But okay. Let me know. Fucking smack the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I and then I, I need. I'm next thing I want to work on. I'm and I, and that's also gonna be in the works as well. Is I need to work my stand up special. So yeah, yeah. That'll be in the works as well. All that gonna happen. You know, all that's gonna happen this year. Yeah, yeah. Man. And then um, then I want to produce. You know, I did actually did this movie back in like. Tw 11 years ago, but now I want to do it right. You know, when I did it, I just did it with like, um, you know, a little $50,000 budget, my own money, and then I was selling it on the road as a DVD to, after my shows, you know, yeah, as a souvenir for my fans to take home. But now I want to redo it right. So this is nice. a very great concept. It's a, it's a Scarface spoof, so look out for that. I'm going to shoot that Dope. this year as well. Dope. That's what's up. That's what's up. And uh, and talking about movies and everything like that, uh, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, one the somebody who's killing it on the series, the movie game, and everything. Uh, when it come down to like uh, Fifty Cent, are you are you and Fifty cool now? Oh, Remember, I know at one point in time y'all was, I, I it probably was joking. No, he was had joke. dudes me pressing you and all of that. Me and Fifty always been cool. Yeah, yeah. Y'all uh, both jokesters though, man. I can tell you know. Dude, yeah, man. yeah. God, if you know if if, if another rapper want to be a comedian, yeah, that nigga should be Fifty. Fifty Cent definitely. Yeah, cool. he got 
so brilliant too, man. In fact, he gave me a, he gave me a, a joke before that I used, and I'm killing it with it. Yeah, yeah. So shout out to Fifty, man. That's dope. That's what's up, man. So we can't leave without you talking about one of the biggest flexes I believe someone can have, which is your school, man. Mm-hmm. So you got a school that you built in in, in Ghana. Done. Mm-hmm. The school's open. Kids wow. are in school. You wow. know, opening it up um, January. Well, the cer- opening ceremony was January third, and the school started January tenth. Kids are in school, man. It's a private school that's completely free for the children. Yeah. Free everything. Free uniform. Wow. Free lunch. Free everything. You know, I just, this is just something I felt like I had to do. You know, um, I, I had the vision when I first went back home after being in America. I told you when I went back for the first time in like yeah. 2001. Yeah. And I saw kids walking around during school hours and uh. found out they couldn't afford to go to school. They came in for a uniform. They, even some of the government schools, which is like supposed to be public schools, still gonna cost a little bit of money here and there. Yeah. These kids couldn't afford nothing. Uh. And that's why they couldn't go to school. I'm like, I gotta do something about it. So yeah, yeah. fast forward to like 2019, you know, I was able to save some money. I'm like, I gotta get this done. Yeah. And I started building in 2019. The pandemic kind of slowed us down a little bit, you know, but, like, thank God everything's done. The school is open. Kids are in school. Uh, And it's a great feeling to give back. Amazing. Amazing. Give back. Man, shout out for you, you know, doing that. That's amazing, man. Can't can't beat that. Like I say, to me, that's the biggest flex anybody can ever, you know, have. That's It is. I became, like, an instant hero to the whole continent of Africa when that happened because People in my country are not used to getting nothing for free. You know, yeah, they yeah. always people always expect you to be getting something back. I'm like, it's nothing. I'm just it feels good. To yeah, get back. yeah. And people should try more often, man. Get back and watch how good it feels. Yeah, real talk, real talk. Uh, uh, last question. You know, you got a let's say you got a young actor out there, comedian. You know, from from Africa who is new to America and want to make it in the industry. Mm-hmm. What advice would you give that young man? Hey man, you gotta put in work. You gotta work hard. You gotta pull God first. You know, don't take no for. Think my Africans, man. Even anybody, man. You know, don't take no for an answer. Just you know, you keep pushing. You keep pushing and keep doing what you have to do to get there. And you know, here's the thing: when it's your time, though, you know, when God says your time, whether it's a year, two years, ten years, twenty five years, yeah. you know, when it, when He says your time, it will be your time. But yeah. in the meantime, just keep working hard towards it. Yeah, you know, and don't think, don't have, not, don't think things gonna come and be handed to you, man. Go and get it. Nothing was ever handed to me. I work. I was never managed. I never had everything I did. I went and I got it on my own. I went and worked for it. I went and found out about it. You know, so don't expect you know nothing to be handed to you, man. Go out there and go get what God has for you. You know, and when it's that time for you to shine, you will shine. Don't yeah. don't compromise yourself. You know, don't take the easy way out. You know, you just keep doing, just keep working hard, and then let God do His thing. Man, that's what's up. That's what's up. You know, and any shout out to anything like that, you know, Mike? Uh, shout out to all the single ladies with multiple problems. <laughs> nah, man, shout out to, you know, shout out to um everybody that's, you know, out there working hard, doing their thing, you know. Shout out to my continent, shout out to whole Africa, shout out to Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria, shout out to, you know, all the foreigners that come to this country and bust their ass every day you know what i'm saying and to just to send a couple of dollars home to their family shout out to them hard working people i ran into a guy the, the other day from cameroon that now he owns like a whole store with wigs weaves and doing hair and everything he started off with like nothing you know so yeah shout out to anybody to come out there you know and then just put in the hard work yeah yeah and you know and you you reap what you sell man just keep working hard and put god first and you'll be just fine real talk man appreciate you yes, mike sir. man Man, it's your boy Paul P. Michael Blackson, man. Love you all. We out of here. Peace out, man. Doses, man. I